My shots. Ever so much, Madam Speaker. Well, well, there you have it. In the Minister's own words, as clear as he could possibly be, it's absolutely and abundantly clear that this government have absolutely no intention whatsoever of moving speedily to replace this government's ethics adviser. And if all of that crowd at the back benches of the Conservative Party are prepared to be taken in by this rubbish, then God help them when they're actually trying to consider some important issues of today. Now, what we've heard from the Minister is that there will be a review into the arrangements about the appointment of an of a ethics adviser and why he couldn't just come to the dispatch box and state exactly and clearly what he intends to do instead of mucking around with all of this rubbish and nonsense skipping through God knows how many hoops and dancing on the, the head of so many pins and just tell us exactly what they intend to do. It would have been much more useful to the House if we had to listen to something like half an hour of absolutely unmitigated rubbish. And now we know they have nothing other to do than to create some sort of review about how they will take this forward. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I don't know, even know where to start when it comes to considering the ethics of this particular Prime Minister and this government. This is a Prime Minister that has the ethics of a caligula of a government that has the morals of the last days of the Borgias. And after all of this, Madam Deputy Speaker, how this Prime Minister is still in place must go down in the history books as one of the great mysteries of the early 20th century politics. And when the book is written and that feature film is eventually released, people will ask, did all that seriously happen? Surely this must be a fictional account of this particular Conservative government. There has never been a Prime Minister quite like this. He's a weird combination of privilege, narcissism, nastiness, naivety, all wrapped up under that bumbling facade that he's carefully concocted to make this multitude of sins evaporate in front of our faces. He is about the worst Prime Minister to be in place at the worst possible time. No one has been more ill equipped to run a community council, far less the government of an advanced, developed nation and democracy in Western Europe. And if there's one Prime Minister that's in need of ethical advice and the assistance of a moral compass, it is surely this Prime Minister. Far from doing away from this post, as is now abundantly clear, what they should be doing is spending the U half of the UK's GDP and creating an army of ethical advisers just to get to the top of what's going on in, within this particular government. But I have to say, like the Culture Secretary, I was just a little bit surprised to find that we actually had an ethics adviser. I mean, I wouldn't have been surprised at all if this Prime Minister had an adviser for hedonism and partying hard. But, but ethics, he must be keeping his several successes in the course of the past few years hidden beneath a, a particularly big bushel. I don't know if he's been a bit distracted when this government were breaking the laws that they themselves created whether they were, he was distracted when they were threatening to break international law, when they oversaw a culture at number 10 that partied so hard that people were physically sick, got into fights and then abused the staff that was there to clean it up, or a government that attempted to prorogue Parliament unlawfully and which continues to put their own cronies and donors in the House of Lords. But I suppose it cuts enough is enough, even for the most patient, distracted and forgiven adviser. And the recognition finally dawns that this is an impossible task beyond the realms of human wit. So it comes as absolutely no surprise that they feel they can function quite adequately without an ethics adviser in place. They've been through two in the course of the past few years, neither felt that they could make any real difference to the ethics and the behaviour of this Prime Minister. But it leads, leads me to ask, what, what would a, an effective ethics adviser to this Prime Minister actually look like? Well, an ability to turn a blind eye, being able to stomach some of the worst possible behaviour at the worst possible time. Maybe, I suppose, you must be able to take the abuse and disparaging comments from some of the Prime Minister's friends, friends like the Cultural Secretary, who in their usual measured and respectful way calls the current Lord Geit, Lord Get It who voters didn't care what he was or what he did. And as part of the recruitment drive for the next ethics adviser, the Culture Secretary encouraged potential applicants for the post that the public don't give a fig about the job. Now watch the great and good run forward to try and claim that particular prize, Madam Deputy Speaker. When the, 
Yes, of course, we'll give it to them. To the honourable gentleman, he's making a typically uh, measured speech himself. And in talking about ethics and standards, can he confirm whether the SNP Westminster Group still has a zero tolerance approach to sexual harassment and inappropriate behaviour, as a leaked recording this weekend would indicate that is no longer the case? Obviously, I, I will, I'm not going to discuss any sort of leaked information that's been passed to the press. But what I'll say to the honourable gentleman, if he's sitting in a glass house with a big rock, it's probably best not to throw that particular rock in any direction whatsoever. And I'll remind him that I was on the ICGS and put together that report, which is now in place one of the most successful initiatives we've had in tackling abuse in this place. And I'll take great pride in the fact that that was part of the arrangements concerning that. But I'm just going to finish with the culture sector and just say to her, you know, like once she's finished her tenure in the DCMS, which hopefully will be short-lived, she can maybe go on to become an international diplomat or peacemaker, given her ability to say the right things at the right time when it comes to issues which require some sensitivity and care, like she has done in the last few weeks. Also, in an attempt to save face and further discredit Lord Guy. This is perhaps one of the most concerning pieces of spin that we have seen in the course of the past few days. The Government were able to develop a narrative that his resignation was nothing to do with the Prime Minister, nothing to do with his appalling behaviour. It was all about something about a misunderstanding about steel. Now, Lord Guy, because of the remarks that have come from the Government and some of the spin that we have seen in the Government's friends and the, the newspapers felt it necessary to write a second last letter to yeah. clarify exactly why he resigned. And he said it was nothing about steel. Steel was an absolute and utter distraction. He said it was instead about being asked to approve deliberate breaches of international law, given the government's widely publicised openness to this. On that point, would you give way? Yes, of course. Yeah. I'm grateful to my honourable friend uh, for giving way. Um, the minister seemed very reluctant to confirm that there will be a new adviser appointed any time soon. Does he think that's probably because the government has it in mind to breach several international treaties in the coming months, and it would be very awkward for them to have an advisor in place who would be uh, advising them against that, or possibly resigning again because of their plans to do so? Uh, I think my honourable friend is making coming to the right conclusions about their indecision when it comes to this. And their, their apparently clear intention of not having an ethics advisor put in place at the earliest possible opportunity. And there's a number of things coming out. I'm going to mention a couple of them that is in the entry just now for any advisor to have a look at, and some things which can, can, I think concern greatly the people that says Yes, of course, go I wonder if the Speaker, if the Honourable Member would agree with me. There's further delay, further dilly dallying about the appointment of an ethics advisor does nothing whatsoever to restore public confidence in our government. Well, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely and utterly right. I, I don't think I've, in my 20 odd years in this House, have seen the House in such a dilapidated condition where the public trust in the activities of this House, the way that we do business, the way that we conduct ourselves has been so badly misunderstood and interpreted by the public and it is incumbent upon this House that we start to try and put these things, these things right. But getting back to our good friend Lord Gite, maybe I don't know what it was about the, the comments which said that he was, he was left in an impossible and odious position that, and that he could not be a party to advising any potential law breaking that led to any misunderstanding about his intention to resign from his, his role and the real reasons why he eventually got round to it. Maybe he had to get rid of Lord Guy because it was he who previously investigated the controversy over how the PM funded the refurbishment of the Prime Minister's flat above 11 Downing Street. And to, my honourable friend refers to several issues that may be requiring the attention of a future independent, independent ethics adviser, but surely the one that must be at the top of his inbox will be the emerging issue and concern that we have, that the Prime Minister was seriously cons considering appointing his now wife into the role of a special adviser in the Foreign Office. And that is something, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I think that this House will have to come back to and consider properly and in due course. And although Lord Guy concluded the Prime Minister had not broken the ministerials on the Prime Ministerial flat, what happened was the Conservative Party was later fined £17,800 for the improper declaration of the nation. So Lord Guy is gone, 
And I get the impression that Downing Street is not particularly upset about that. So what's to be done? I've got no problem or issue with the Labour Party's motion, and I will support it. The only thing I'd say to the Labour Party is I wouldn't give them the chance to try and find an independent uh, advisor for the government's ethics. I think it should be a matter for the House anyway. I, I, I don't know why we're, we're, we're allowing this opportunity where a government, and I accept the point that some of these issues are, are relevant and, and pertinent to government activity and business itself, but surely this House should have some sort of say through the function of its committees about who does this monitoring about how that person is appointed, because it's not worked pretty well in the course of the past few independent advisors that we've had. And, but to find somebody, it would need somebody, I think, who would have the attributes of Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Colombo, and George Washington combined <laughs> to be able to do this role effectively. But in Scotland, of course, we have a much more neat and easier way out of this midden, and that's simply to leave you all to it and leave you to get on with it yeah, in your own yeah. time, in your own way. I have no idea what Scotland has done within its history and its past to deserve governance such as this, but believe me, Madam Speaker, me and my colleagues are doing everything possible to ensure that situation is going to be rectified. Where it's right that we put forward the case for independence, as we will, and as we will convince the Scottish people of its merits, all we have to do sometimes is just get the Scottish people to turn on the Parliament channel and observe this House, and then they're rushing and they're having increased enthusiasm about the cause of Scottish independence. The choice is going to be up to the Scottish people to be governed by these privileged Etonian spivs with their one rule for them approach to government or become a self-governing nation run by the people who care most about Scotland, the people who live and work there.